Welcome back to the Give and Go. Oh, okay. oh technical difficulties. Technical difficulties. Welcome back to the Give and Go. I'm your co-host Reynoso here with my boy Saltero. Let's focus on this French team, man. France has an incredible history in this tournament, man. An incredible history that we've been able to witness ourselves. 16 appearances at the World Cup with 2022. 1930, they were part of that first. Uh, World Cup, one of four European teams that attended that tournament. Good for them. Group stage exit. 1958, they had a third place finish. 1982, fourth place finish. Damn. 1986, third place finish. Until finally, in 1998, when they hosted the tournament, they beat Brazil 3-0 in the final to become champions. A team that had Zidane on it, that had, I believe, Didier Deschamps on it as well. Oh, yeah. Then 2006 came. My first World Cup, and I saw an incredible French team full of absolute legends beat a Brazilian team in the quarterfinals. They then beat Portugal in the semifinal, and then in the final, they played against Italy, and that's where the famous Zidane headbutt yep. came into play. What a crazy moment that was, bro. Do you remember that? I remember. I was in Canada at the time. I was, <laughs> at, uh, <laughs> I was at Niagara Falls and caught the game at a bar, and... I just remember people going crazy. I was a kid at the time. Yeah. I was a child. Uh, and so I was like, what is going on? But yeah, I remember the incident very clearly. I remember that more than the actual game, to be honest. Because yeah. I just wasn't that into football at the time. Yeah, it's one of the craziest moments in all of sports, in my opinion. I just, I can't believe that's how it played out. That photo of Sidon walking past the World Cup trophy will be forever cemented in his history and also French World Cup history. <laughs> Fast forward to 2018. A French side, completely new, completely revamped, shows up to the tournament and takes the tournament by storm, becoming eventual champions and seeing so many different players have just the moment of their lives. Kylian Mbappe winning the tournament at, what, 18, 19 years of age, Pogba scoring goals, yeah. Matuidi having one of his final 10 years with France, Pavard, Hernandez, Varane, Umtiti, just the team was stacked with really good players at show that they had the championship grit and stamina to win the tournament. Qualified by getting first in Group D with five wins, three draws, zero losses, 18 goals for, three goals against. They then get drawn into Group D of the World Cup where they have Denmark, Tunisia, and Australia. Nearly the same identical group they had in 2018, funny enough. And so it'll be interesting to see how that group plays out with slightly different iterations of these teams now. And so that's the story for France, man. The question that gets prompted so much once you're a defending champ is, will you be haunted by the World Cup curse? Will you fall short like that, like that German team, like that Spanish team, like that Italian team? It's been a pattern for nearly two decades now, man. Is it going to happen to France this time around? Will they actually not be able to qualify out of Group D? Lots of questions to be asked of this team now that they're facing some injuries, but still, there's a lot of prowess on this squad. There's a lot of talent and a lot of grit. France could very well still be on their way to another championship if they manage to play their cards right. It's for that reason that I'm super interested to in know, what do you think about this French team? Going into this tournament, France are the only team with something tangible to actually protect other than maybe pride. They have to protect the label of being reigning world champions. And I love that narrative. Because as you said, when I, when I think of this French squad, the first thing that I think of, bro, is that curse. It's hard not to think about it. And I actually want to go back. I want to go back to the couple World Cups that I saw and kind of review those reigning champions at the time. Italy in 2010 were god-awful. God awful. You could tell off that first kick of the ball <laughs> in their first game. Like, oh, they're not even getting any, yeah. anywhere close to yeah. that trophy. Yeah. 2014, I actually thought Spain would do a little bit better, man. And, you know, I had good reason to. They were the first team to win three major international tournaments in a row. Euros 08, World Cup 10, Euros Crazy. 2012. Crazy. So I was like, they have... A large majority of the same players that made them successful. So I was like, why not? You know, I really saw them getting out of the group. What I did not expect was for Chile and the Netherlands to go off, bro. They went off. Spain, the only way they were going to get out of the group is if they were playing at the top of the level, and they weren't. So they were in a really tough group, unknowingly, in my opinion, and they just weren't ready. 
They simply weren't ready. And honestly, it was just a good moment for Spain to start transitioning their players yeah. because a yeah. lot of the players they that made them successful in years prior were still kind of there and they're still relying on them, maybe a little bit too much. So maybe it was a necessity for them to actually get out of the group kind of at an early stage, right, in the tournament. 2018, Germany. Based off of how dominant they were in 2014, man, and even though some games were tight, obviously, but just, you know, the machine, the, the, the German team that we saw in 2014, I was like, there's just no way that they're not getting out of this group in 2018. I was just like, they have too, too much of a winning mentality. They still had Yogi Love leading this team. And again, a lot of the players that made them successful in 2014 were still there playing at a good level with their club. So I was like, okay, Germany are going to break this curse and get out of this goddamn group. But my God, little did they know that they'd have <laughs> yeah. to play against a very inspired Mexican side, a complete team in Sweden, and a, an X-Factor in South Korea. So at the end of the day, for me, seeing Germany crash out of the group stage, I was like, holy shit, maybe this curse is real. Like, this isn't just, you know, some, someone's fantasy. Like, this is actually a curse that transfers from one <laughs> champion to the other <laughs> as soon as you touch that trophy, yeah, man. man. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah. It's scary. But this is where it gets interesting, man. 2022 France might be different. And I know, again, maybe I've been tripped before. I've been tripped before in Spain and Germany in these last two World Cups. But France this year really do interest me. And the reason why I think it gets intriguing is because a lot of the players that made France really successful four years ago are still here. But yes, there's some major exclusions due to injury. Major but what gets really interesting with this French squad is maybe they've replaced them with just incredible talent coming through the ranks. Dude, some of these youth players that are 20, 21, 22, who've only had like 20 caps for France over these last four years have really come up at club level, man. And I mean really come up. Regardless of if you don't have Gante or Pogba at this World Cup, dude, France might still have pound for pound, one of the best teams talent-wise at this World Cup. So for that reason, France might have a good case here. They might have a good case to actually contend and protect their title. So before we get into player selection in this midfield, bro, I actually do want to provide a little bit of analysis on what made France so successful in 2018. Because I think for me, all of their success and their offense started in this midfield. You had N'Golo Kante, basically the engine and the genesis for France's offense in every single game. For me, every single attack started with N'Golo Kante retrieving the ball. And what's crazy about Kante is that you essentially get two players out on that pitch with one. <laughs> Kante's the equivalent of having two yeah. midfielders. He covers that much space. And the thing is, once he gets that ball, he has the IQ and the ball handles to make the right decision, whether it's to give it to a creator in Pogba, give it to a runner in Matuidi, or give it to true midfield class in Antoine Griezmann, or maybe give it to Olivier Giroud, who acted as a receiver for France in 2018. And then you also obviously had Mbappe just running Ooh. down those wings and breaking those lines. But it, for me, it started with N'Golo Conte's ball retrieval. And then from there, France really worked very well as a squad together to kind of move that ball around and get everyone in their best positions. For me, midfield creation was a big point of France's attack in 2018 because you had Pogba, who was not asked to defend. That's why you had Kante, because he could cover Pogba's space yeah. and his own. I thought Matuidi was also pretty big with retrieval yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so France's midfield three, so crucial, bro. Kante, Matuidi, Pogba. But then after that, you still had, again, class with Griezmann and Mbappe. And then Giroud's so clever, bro. Oh, my gosh. So yeah. he was, clever. He was witty that tournament. He man. was. He <laughs> was. He, he really was. He just knew where to place yeah. that ball. And he wasn't really asked to score, but he took that role on so, so well. I don't think he'd scored either. Too. I don't think he had a single goal that yeah, tournament. No, uh, he didn't. Purely a provider for the team. Exactly. And that teamwork, I think, really set France to have a very good tournament, bro. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Conte's irreplaceable. 
for 2022. Deschamps has not found a like-for-like like replacement yeah. in that defensive midfield position. So what I've seen Deschamps do, especially recently, is actually not even try to cover that space in general. I've seen him drop that defensive midfield position and bring him down to a center back position where he plays with actually a back three. And I've seen him do that, I would say, over the last 12 months because either Conte or Pogba have had knocks, bro, for these last 12 or 18 months. So it's actually kind of a blessing that they've kind of been injured throughout this last year because this isn't a surprise for Deschamps. He's kind of had time to prepare for either Conte or Pogba to miss this tournament. And it's, it sucks that they're both going to miss it. But Deschamps has had time to kind of come up with an idea, a scheme to still be successful. And I think that's what he's going to do. I'm going to predict that he's actually going to start with a back three because he knows he cannot get that central coverage with any other defensive midfielder that he has. He has incredible midfielders. He knows that. But he knows that he's not going to get the same defensive coverage with all the midfielders that he has at his disposal. So what is he going to do? Well, he's just going to slot in another center back in that position. And when you look at the center backs that he has at his disposal, disposal man he's got world-class center backs so I actually think it's a really good decision for Deschamps to do something like that and another thing is since there's no Pogba he's not going to have a creative midfielder either so if he plays with a back three then he's not going to have a midfield three anymore he's just going to have two midfield pivots to just kind of roam around the pitch get the ball and instead of having that midfield creation that he had in 2018 He's going out wide, baby. He's going to have two wing backs and two forwards. And I think he's going to have Griezmann as kind of a creative pivot in that midfield. So he's kind of switching from a central point of play that he had back in 2018. And I think he's going out wide because he just does not have that midfield creation with Pogba and the defensive coverage in Golo Conte. So I actually see France having three at the back, two wing backs two midfielders, and then three up front, whether Griezmann could be playing a secondary roaming role. That's what I see. And so for these midfield two, I think that's what we can start talking about. The options at hand are interesting. You could go with Camavinga. You go with Fofana from Monaco. You can go with Guendouzi, Rabio. You can go with Vertu from Marseille as well. And then finally, you can go with Starboy, Chouameni. Yeah. from Real Madrid. Yeah. You mentioned they have these players in their early 20s already playing at super prestigious clubs. Chouamini is the, it's one of the prime examples of that, man. Yeah. The way I see Deschamps playing out this midfield position will be Rabio on one side and then Chouamini on the other. Rabio is actually in a little bit of form right now. Scoring yeah. goals and assisting in like four last five games for Juve who are finally, finally finding some form. <laughs> <laughs> finally yeah, winning yeah. games. I think they've won the last five Serie A games in a row. Yeah. And he's actually been a really important part of that. And I think Rabio, I mean, you just gotta you just gotta fly with that. You gotta work with that. It's pretty crazy looking back at it now or thinking that this this is what his career is built up to. I don't know if I ever thought of Rabio as like the main man for France's midfield, but Shit, these injuries yeah. are have opened up a window for Rabio to have a golden opportunity here to honestly prove a lot of people wrong, man, because for years and even for myself, I haven't thought the highest about Rabio. Yeah. I thought he can be a little erratic at times, a little undisciplined. And I think it showed in his play. It's why oftentimes you'll see him just make be, be prone to mistakes in that midfield or be the cause or reason for the opposing team getting a goal or getting a goal-scoring opportunity. But with the way he's playing right now, with the other options at hand, I think he I think he has it in him to step up to that pedestal and be able to provide some good solidity there. Likewise, I think Chuameni is a straight-up baller. And I know we've been saying baller in this pod a lot, but... This guy's yeah. a baller, bro. A baller. Yeah. When you play for Real Madrid at such a young age, that's the best practice you could have for a World Cup stage, man, because you're already dealing with so much criticism. You're already dealing with so much so much exposure and yeah. being in the limelight already. And he's been able to show that he can easily, seamlessly find his role at Real Madrid and thrive, living up to that price tag of which he was bought for and just proving to be a really good player. I think you got to give him that opportunity because... If anything, I, I have more assurance that he'll show out over Rabio. The two midfielders that I have, I think, are Chuameni and Rabio, to be completely honest. And I know the other guys do have good shouts. Vertu and Guendouzi have actually had very good seasons. They've had solid seasons, yeah, yeah, let's say. Solid. To probably start like in any other competition for France, like if it was Nations League, hell, even if it was Euros, they could probably get a decent shout. But since this, this is the World Cup, I think Deschamps knows that his best two midfielders in this position, in these positions, are going to be Chouameni and Rabio. Although I will say this, I think the third option who will 
might find himself starting maybe in some games because I do think some of this is actually based on preference. I think it's going to be Yusuf Fofana. Just recently this season popped off at Monaco, bro. You see this guy play, and you you just know he's got that talent, man. He just got he's... rid of Chouamini, man. <laughs> oh, and man. he just comes in. <laughs> oh, my God. That's man. true. That's true. Monaco's been having some good midfielders recently, bro. Holy shit. But Fofana, man, I really like his style of play. To be honest, I like him a little bit better than Rabio, but it's only because he's a little bit more risky, which could be a contention for him to actually not start. I think Fofana's definitely a more of a ball handler than he is a passer. And if you have a dribbler like Chua Meni, who also kind of likes to hold on to the ball, that might not be the best duo in the center of that pitch for Deschamps. So I think the wiser option would be a, a higher IQ guy like Rabio, alongside obviously a stud like Chua Meni. But I think Fofana can come off the bench and provide a lot of possessive relief because he's because his skill set is just so high. Yeah, I think that honestly the same can be said about Kamavinga. I can see him st- have, playing a role just straight off the bench. Same, straight no, same. off the bench. Yeah, and, and he's done it a lot for Real Madrid. Honestly, it's like the beginning of his career there. That's the role he embodied was just coming off the bench and providing relief, providing a, a attack as well if needed. It's a matter of just Deschamps looking over his shoulder and being like, mid game, who's gonna get that call? Yeah, who, yeah, who, yeah. Who wants it more? You want, you want to give it a shot, Kamavinga? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you scoot backwards, and man, this is insane, the options that they have here. It's yeah. ridiculous. I'm going to start off by listing names here. Rafael Varane, the World Cup winner, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 29 years old, coming off of a bit of an injury, That's but still problem. showing up to the tournament. Kanate, Liverpool's Kanate. Upamecano yep. from Bayern Munich. Saliba. Kunde could play center back if needed. Di Sassi from Monaco as well, being a late call up, replacing Kim Pempe, yeah. who had to go out due yeah. to injury. And then you have options and fluid type of players that, like Pavard, he could potentially slip over to that center back role if needed. And same with Lucas Hernandez if needed as well, bro. That's exactly. I think about eight different names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of world class center backs that you can choose from. So to think that they're going to be in a three center back setup is super interesting because. Who gets called up? Who gets that spot? One guy for sure. And it has to be for certain that this guy will get the call up in that spot is Saliba. Yeah. You have to. You have to with his rise, with how well he's done at Arsenal right now. Commanding that back line up to first place in the goddamn Premier League, man. That's yeah. that's insane. He, insane. Yeah, he's been a revelation this year at Arsenal. Not only has his defense been world class, but he can get forward at times. Low key, kind of like Ramos does. He he does not shy away from getting into the opponent's box if the shape is right. He's like, fuck it, I'm a, I'm a going up, I'm going yeah. up, coach. Yeah. And he he can. He's, I think he's got two goals already for Arsenal this season. So from a center back position, that's really helpful. So I definitely have Saliba starting as a center back for France. I think a guy that will pair up alongside him is gonna be Dial Upamecano, who has been very good for Bayern Munich this year. I think he's had an interesting past couple of years leading up to finally him having a good season at Bayern. I remember when he was with RB Leipzig, there's always some times where he'd make a couple of yep, mistakes, yep. you know, but that honestly could be chalked down to just how young he really was. Once he got to Bayern and after he's been there, now I think for a year now, he's really shaped up to be a very solid center back. So I see Upa Meccano and Saliba being for sure the starting center backs for Didier Deschamps at this World Cup. Now, the only reason why I say that specifically is because, again, you already said it, Varane is kind of has a knock right now. He's been out for the last three weeks. He is set to be healthy come a week time but that, that's the thing. He hasn't played in maybe around a month. So he's going to be a little, he's going to be a little stiff maybe going to this first game. So maybe we don't see Varane in that first game, but maybe after he starts getting back into training for this French squad, maybe we see him being that third center back for France. Because in my opinion, if Varane is fully healthy, he starts 100%. Yeah, I think he has to. He has, I think to. He has to. Even, I think even a slightly injured Varane still starts, man. Yeah. He, he's become, the, I think so. He's the Shams go to guy back there, man. And yeah. Just the thing, the the resume he has. No one else from these other two center backs that we mentioned haven't actually played a World Cup game. Varane has that in his resume, man. Exactly. Like that, that to me is too important. And I, I do think he's one of Deschamps' favorites. It just sucks that there really is no form for There's no Varane. Form, man. There's no form, but I think that's part of the reason for why I don't think Kanate starts because he's kind of similar to Varane. Thing is, he actually has been able to get a few games in this past month, yeah. but for a good while he was out, and he's just now starting to find his flow. And again, it's because of that pedigree of him already winning a World Cup. 
And the thing is, you know, I think there would be a lot more decisions for Deschamps to make. But again, a lot of these other center backs actually do have knocks. Jules Koundé mm -hmm. just got injured last week, but he's still set to be fit in a week or two. So that's why he got called up. But I just don't see Koundé starting because of that knock. Lucas Hernandez has been out for two months. He just got back to training last week. So obviously he's going to get called up. The only two truly fit center backs are Upa Mecano and Saliba. That's why I have them for sure starting. And if they do go with a back three, I think Varan does start because of that pedigree. But yeah, I, I think there'd be a lot more decisions to be had if everyone else wasn't fucking injured. Yeah, goalkeeper for sure is Yoris. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for, yeah, sure. for sure. 35 years of age, the captain of this French squad. You have to go with him. He's still not too old, in my opinion. Still proving to make really good saves for Tottenham at the club level. That's easy. No more conversation to be had here. Outside of the fact that Mike Magnon didn't get the call up. Dude, I saw that, yeah. man. I was like, holy that shit. One, that one was, that was a little, that one, that, that's to be a little bit personal, man. Yeah, it they got to. Ariola, but he's always been either second or third choice, so I get that. But yeah, man, the decision to go with Steve Mandanda, interesting. I get it, because Mandanda has been in the French system as a goalkeeper for a long time. I understand that. But manyan has got to be the better goalkeeper. He has to. He has to. He's, he's an informed too, yeah, He's man. in incredible form right now with Milan. I just, I truly don't understand that decision. Either way, though, I guess he can sleep easy at night knowing he wasn't going to play. Because nah, nah, it's nah. obviously Yoris's spot. But still, to not go. Yeah, I, it's I think about it, the reward, yeah, man. Yeah, it's about the reward. Yeah, it's a little disrespectful. But, you know, we've talked about ego and stuff with coaching and squad selection. So maybe this is yeah, one of those cases. The champs got it too then? <laughs> God Dude, damn, everyone, Every coach has got it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, I'd have it when I was a coach. Holy God shit. Damn. Wingbacks. This Wing is backs. an interesting one because I remember one of the things that stood out to the most to me about that 2018 French team was the presence of Lucas Hernandez yeah. and Benjamin Pavard, bro. Those two players were like two peas in a pod, man. Yeah. Yin and yang, water yeah. to fire. Like, they were <laughs> incredible. The way they manipulated opposing team defenses by yeah. sending in killer crosses or, like, in Benjamin Pavard's case, scoring absolute bangers, man. Who yeah. could forget that goal oh, he got man. against Argentina? I'll never forget it. Incredible quality and spin on that shot. These guys are very well capable of good moments at the World Cup. They proved that to me in 2018. The interesting thing is, is that their roles kind of shifted these past four years. Yeah. They switched over to more of a center back position for both of them. They both kind of flip in and out of left back, yeah. right back, and center back positioning. I feel confident, though, putting them in a spot in a wing back position to give them a little bit more of offensive duties because they've got it in them to provide, man. What's interesting, I think, in Lucas and Nandes' case is the presence of Theo Hernandez. His brother. Who I just found out today is his goddamn brother, man. <laughs> Lil bro. Lil bro. <laughs> and Lil bro's having a good season, He's having a man. good season. Lil bro's having a good season. Another AC Milan product. Mm -hmm. Is there an argument to be had here with Theo Hernandez being a more offensive player than Lucas, yeah. especially if they're pushed up a little bit more in that wingback position yeah. to potentially start? Yeah, I have Theo starting solely because it's going to be a wingback position. If he's going to lose midfield creativity by not having Paul Pogba, he's got to have creativity elsewhere. I think Theo is in a more offensive form than Lucas. Lucas obviously has been injured for a month and a half now. I think mm -hmm. that makes it a slightly easier decision, to be completely honest, for Deschamps to just go with Dale, in my humble opinion. Yeah, and then obviously on the other side, I think it's Pavard's. Pavard's position, no matter what, even though you're right, I remember seeing him playing as a third center back role for Bayern Munich, and I was like, what? He's so good as a right? fullback, yeah. man. I'm like, well, why like shunt his ability like that? <laughs> I was like, God damn it. Because, you know, that might translate to poor performances for France, but I think Pavard's smart enough to still understand his role for this French squad. Obviously, I do think he still has the technique to go forward and still be very effective offensively. So I'm really not worried about that right wing back position because I, I do think that Pavard still has it. What is interesting, though, and I guess if you follow this French squad, one big exclusion from the whole 26, Jonathan Klaus, who went off last year with Lenz, who's having a good season this year, actually, yeah. got the move to Marseille this year, man. And in my opinion, he's been mid He's been really mid, but his performances last season got him his call-up to France. He got tried out by Deschamps. He's, Deschamps saw he was having a good season, called him up, gave him a chance, I think against Denmark, against maybe Austria or some other European team in the Nations League, and Klaus just did not pass the test, man. 
So it really sucks for him, maybe on a personal career level, because that was his opportunity. Yeah. If he did yeah. really well in those Nation League games, I actually could see a good competition between Pavard and Klaus. But Klaus has been, in my opinion, not good this season for Marseille. So for that reason, I think it's all Pavard's position. Now let's get to the fun part, man. Let's get to the fun part, which is this French offense. What's really interesting about them is that in 2018, there actually was a, a different array of talent available to the French. Benzema was not present, and Kunku still hadn't shown up and rose to the scene either. And now recent call-up, Turam, was not there either. Yeah. So that's about three, four different names that have shown up to this French offense. And so it'll be interesting to see how Deschamps approaches it because you still have high-level quality players that, in a way, have kind of secured their spot with Kylian Mbappe. He is for sure going to find his way in the starting lineup, probably on that left side, Yeah. paired up with... Benzema, man. Has to it's got to be. Benzema coming off of an incredible Ballon d'Or campaign yeah. now has the opportunity to continue that momentum of success with the French national team, something that I've always wanted to see, man. Yeah. Benzema needs to have that international recognition. Ooh. And to have it be on a World Cup stage, man, it's yeah. going to be an incredible thing to see coming off of last year. The question I have then is, what's Griezmann's role in this team? Griezmann's been interesting this this past <laughs> season, man. Real interesting. In 2018, completely different player. Oh, yeah. Completely different state of mind. Yeah, yeah. Completely different trajectory. Like I mentioned, Dembele is back on this team now. Really good form right now. 5-5 five and five in La Liga. Looking great. Kingsley Coman got the call up as well. Turam scoring, banging in goals for Munchen Gladbach. And yeah. Cuckoo's doing another great season in the Bundesliga for Leipzig. Yeah, yeah. Giroud's fucking Giroud. Yeah, yeah. No, that's the thing. They still have Giroud. Yeah, to play. bro. Yeah. That's crazy. And if it worked with him in 2018, then why shy away from it? I need, I need clarity, bro. Yeah, I need yeah. clarity. And, and that's one thing I want to post to the audience is offensively, what's the right move here? Who should start? Who should get that trust from Deschamps? Because we have so many interesting offensive politics going on here with the, yeah. the cases that can be made for so many different players. It's funny because when I think about this offensive three, if you want to call them that, for me, there's no debate. There's no argument. You can say whatever you want. Deschamps is starting... Three players and three players only. At least do start. And it's going to be Mbappe, Benzema, and Griezmann. And I want to start with my boy Antoine Griezmann. Greasy. Obviously the colchonero, the Atletico yep, Madrid. Yep. Legend at this point. And it is funny because there was a split second. I was like, does Griezmann start? Yeah. Like, should he? Um, he's got five goals this season, which isn't bad. You know, it's respectable. I think he's got a couple of assists to add to his name as well. But, you know, Griezmann has just had a weird couple of years. Ever since his move to Barcelona, his form has dipped, and you could even say dramatically. But at the end of the day, when Griezmann puts on that France jersey, brother, he's a different player. And I think the Champs actually recognizes yeah. that. I yeah. really do. The way I see Griezmann's role in this French squad, he's the glue. He's the messenger between the midfield line and the offensive line. You need to get a, you need to get a ball to the offense, but you don't know how? Give the ball to Griezmann. He'll figure it out. And that's the thing. He has the pedigree. He has the skill set to play it short, to do a long ball, to score a bicycle kick, to score a free kick, to score a penalty, to get big in the box, turn, score, shoot, cross, whatever you want. <laughs> Griezmann actually has the ability to literally do it all. Now, yes, he is, he is not the same player he was four years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm going to submit to that. But he still has the ideas. He still knows what he wants to do with the ball. And... Honestly, at the end of the day, I think whether people like it or not, I think that Shams actually has a soft spot for Griezmann. I really do. Ever since Griezmann started popping off in 2013, 2014, and found his way into the starting lineup mid-World Cup in 2014, the Shams has never not played him. Yeah, no, yeah. Never. Yeah. And when you look at all the rotation that the Shams has done these last four years, because he's done a lot, bro. Because he just, he, he, <laughs> you've seen that squad list, bro. He could, he could not choose a squad and pick another 20 players, and they'd do decently this Dude, yeah, yeah. They, they really would. Yeah. So the Shams just been having fun these last four years. But who's always really been there? It's Antoine Griezmann, bro. He's still the go-to guy from like a midfield slash secondary striker offensive perspective for Deschamps, man. Didier Deschamps has dreamt of a player like Antoine Griezmann for his entire career. And he finally got him in 2014. And as long as Griezmann is alive and playing football, <laughs> Deschamps is gonna start him. So that I have Griezmann right. easily okay. starting here. And honestly, again, just to finish, 
even though his form has dipped, I actually don't think it's a mistake. I really don't. And I know you have, for example, a much improved Dembele, for example, waiting to play for this French squad. I understand that, but it, it, it's, this is Griezmann's French squad. I really do think so. Does he do the Fortnite dance again? <laughs> <laughs> no, I he's wonder. Got, he's got something built up for this World Cup. You know he does, though. He yeah, plans yeah, this yeah, shit out. <laughs> Let's talk about Mbappe then. Yeah. Let's talk about Mbappe, man, because 2018 became one of the youngest players to ever win the World Cup. 19, yeah. Right? Yeah, Fuck. got added onto that list. But what I loved about his tournament run was that he was actually important to the team. Dude. That he didn't just piggyback his way to a World yeah, Cup victory. Yeah. He was scoring goals in big games for this French team. And good Lord, was he annoying to deal with that whole tournament, man. Yeah. Did you see what he did to Argentina, bro? Yeah, dude, he, he scored some big penalties, scoring goals. Yeah. It was crazy. And he just continued that success all the way up to the final. And that's we're talking about an 18-year-old, 19-year-old kid, man. Yeah, yeah. That kid has gone on to continue his path of success and now just thrive at PSG despite all the drama despite all the things that are said about Mbappe off the pitch you just watch this guy play 90 minutes on the football field and you can just see that he is absolute magic he's one of the best talents in the world he's possibly the only man out there that can match Erling Haaland when you talk about having a similar age range and production on the pitch this man is the next one up and he is going to start for France unquestionably, man, whether yeah. people like it or not, yeah. he is going to be a pivotal part of this team and he's going to have another good tournament, man. And what's crazy is that you pair him up with Ballon d'Or winner Kareem Benzema this time around. Yep. So not only has this player gotten better, gotten stronger, gotten faster, you've also added another player that is essentially what Giroud does 10 times more, man. Yeah. And you're going to have these two yeah. players feeding off of each other, serving each other plates of goal-scoring prowess <laughs> and feasting, bro. Yeah, yeah. Feasting, man. I do not care what drama has passed over these last couple of months at PSG. Sometimes it got a little ugly, you know? Sometimes he really made some big headlines. Uh, you know, maybe criticizing Galtier, his coach, maybe a little bit, you know? Or, you know, having a little bit of on-field spats with maybe his teammates and Messi or Neymar, which, you know, isn't good, <laughs> but when I, but when I, but after a headline is made of something negative about Mbappe, what does he do the next week? He scores two goals and gets an assist. He doesn't really let it affect his performances, dude. He's got twelve goals and fourteen appearances yeah. in the French league. Yeah, that's ridiculous. It's elite, and he's going to pop off yet again, as you said, at this World Cup, regardless of all the storylines, regardless of all that drama. This is Mbappe's tournament yet again at 23 years of age. And I'm excited. I'm really excited because we got to see a young, kind of like blissful Mbappe at 19 years of age. Didn't really know the club scene yet. He had just moved to PSG realistically because yeah, yeah. he had a couple of good seasons at his boyhood club, Monaco. And then finally, he was getting to that big leagues with PSG. And then all of a sudden, he immediately won a World Cup really soon in a player's career. But as you said, he scored goals, man. He really did not rely on anybody else. But he, he himself was one of France's biggest players at 19 years of age. is ridiculous. So I love that we get to see his career really play out, man. And truly, because where do you go after being a World Cup winner? Yeah. Well, you get another one. And, I, I, and if, if there is a guy to truly do it, again, whether people like it or not, it's Kylian Mbappe, man. One of the most elite offensive players on the planet. And he, he, he's still got it. What what he's still got it. What happens to his legacy if he gets another title? Bro? Oh, my fucking What God, happens then, bro. man? What happens then, bro? Yeah, no, what, yeah. What, what, what do we... What, the, the, if he gets the second one, oh, my God. We'd have, to, we'd have to put some respect there, man. No, yeah, yeah. You, you have to go down as, like, one of the best players Jesus, offensively. man. Before, like, 24 years old, he already has two World Cups under his belt. Yeah. That'd be crazy. Throwing Benzema, getting a Ballon d'Or in a World Cup in, like, Jesus. 12 months. Jesus Christ, man. Yeah, it will be crazy, but I do wonder if people will, like, allow that to actually happen because, you know, they'll, they'll kind of... I, I feel like a lot of people will use that stigma of oh, well, he has 10 other World Cast players yep. around him. Well, of yep. course he does. But again, what I really loved about 2018 was Mbappe scored goals. We, again, we've said it three times already, but for me, that actually is a big point of contention as to whether I respect somebody or not because he had to finish some really tough goals, honestly, at times. But 
You, we've seen Mbappe just shoot lasers, lasers. I, I really don't see any other striker in the modern game kick it truly like Mbappe does. Yeah. And I think that's why Mbappe is so good because he truly is one of the most lethal strikers of the ball in today's game. Oh, dude. And he's yeah. going to show it. He's yeah. going to show it in 2022. Uh, you pair that with his speed, man. Yeah, it's, yeah. Have, have you tried playing against him on FIFA, man? I'm holding, <laughs> I'm holding R2 down like it's a fucking, like with everything I have, man. Yeah. I cannot keep up with him, up. bro. You can't catch but up. realistically, you see him outrun these players in the in both the international stage and the club stage, and it's ridiculous, bro. This oh. dude is one of the fastest players I've ever seen on the pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you're right. Couple the finishing ability with that speed, but not only that, true ball handling ability. You see that Juve goal in the Champions oh League? God. Oh my God. One of the dirtiest goals yeah. I think I've ever seen, yeah. bro. Turned a guy, megged another one basically, and then just got big, shrugged off a player, and then curled it oh, fucking he was home. Pulling, he was pulling his yeah. tongue in his fucking jersey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Scored from like, what, 20 yards out too? It's ridiculous, man. It's absolutely ridiculous. And that's killing Mbappe. And France still have that. Going into this World Cup, but, yeah, yeah, but football Twitter thinks thinks he's ass, man. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's frustrating, bro. <laughs> but to talk about, I think a striking partner, yes, Ballon de Oro winner Karim Benzema. The only thing, the only thing that slightly worries me is he's only played half of La Liga games this year because he's been he's had weird injuries. Nothing serious. I read a couple of articles that have said that like. He doesn't want to risk maybe making these little knocks more serious. So he's actually been very careful to come back onto the pitch. If that's the case, then I think that's okay because that means he's still training. He's just being very cautious, which I honestly actually prefer because I want to see a very healthy Karim Benzema play for France. But I just hope that these little knocks aren't going to get to his form. I don't think they will because we're talking about one of the most complete strikers in the game. You said it. He's like Giroud but 10 times better because his hold up play, his teamwork playing ability, his passing, dude, his, his one touch passing might be the best as far as like a number nine yeah, is concerned. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And you couple all of that with his ability to finish like no other, you get one of the most complete strikers in the game and France have that paired alongside one of the most exciting talents in the game in Mbappe. You have one of the most complete offenses going into this World Cup. And we see, we've seen them both play together before and it's electric, man, especially yeah. in the Nations League. I remember when they... I believe they pull off a crazy comeback on Belgium. Oh, and yeah. That, it was purely just the offensive instincts of both these players that carried them back into that match, ultimately winning it. And I was just like, good Lord. Like, if they figure out how to play well together, yeah. it's unstoppable, man. Yeah. It's unstoppable. I guess I'm just curious about, like, the role of the, these other guys. It's just it's crazy to me to see so much talent be left on the bench and, not at the end of the day, not really get used. I mean, Giroud, Nkunku, Turam, Kinsley Komen, Dembele. I mean, the thing is, you do get five subs this tournament, which is important to think about. There That's will true. be more availability for that to happen, but... That's a good point. At the end of the day, I also don't see any reason for why you would sit Benzema or Mbappe in these big-ass matches, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, and I don't think you can, like, yeah. especially if it's just like a goal apart. I feel like you have to keep Mbappe and Benzema on the pitch. What I've seen the Champ do, especially recently, is since Griezmann isn't in the best form, he actually subs out Griezmann a lot, and he'll kind of change shape. So if we say they use a five-two-one-two with Griezmann in that pocket role, he'll take out Griezmann and put on a winger. And then you go, you put Mbappe completely out wide, Benzema down the middle, and then you put that winger now on the other side. So you play actually 5-2-3. So I, that's where I see Dembele actually having a good role off the bench, coming in for Griezmann, pulling out wide, and then you have two wingers and Mbappe and Dembele for France, which I think could actually be a good substitute, basically like a super sub for France if they need yeah. a goal. Another player that I actually could see coming off the bench especially since they now play a wing-back role, is actually Coman, man. Especially since they're playing a kind of a wing-back role, Coman can actually play in either wing-back position. Because he's kind of like a winger, but he's also kind of a little bit more defensive as far as like being a wide midfielder who tracks back often. So I've seen this champ use Coman in that wing-back position, coming on for Pavard and just providing more energy down that wing. So I actually could see Coman and Dembele putting in good shifts on that right wing for France. This team is very much a contender as any other team in this tournament. They're as deep as they could be. Even with two crazy crucial injuries, they still have so many different options that they can go with, and they still can build a team that I think is good enough to win the tournament. I see them in this group, Group D, with Denmark, Tunisia, and Australia. First question that's asked, will the curse happen to France? <laughs> 
answer that question. No, it will not. It ends this year. I just don't see a future. I don't see a reality where that actually happens this time around. France gets out in either first or second. Where it does get interesting is that Denmark low-key kind of has France's number within the Nations League, man. France has also shown that they've been a little shaky throughout these games building up to the major tournament. So there is reason to doubt France in that sense. But for me, I just, I don't know, man. I, I like to pay respect to winners. I like to pay respect to, to my champions. And given the fact that France did this in 2018, that they still have a good core of those players back at this tournament that aren't too old, I almost feel obligated to, to support them in that sense, to pay my dues, you know? Yeah. I think it's a little disrespectful. People are talking about this French team, man. Dude. I think people are getting a little carried away with what Whoa. happened in Nations League when they had to play games one week after the fucking Champions League game was done. Yeah. Like, I think people are being a little disrespectful, bro. Yeah. Let's... Let's stay cautious because this team is still very, very talented. In the Denmark video, I said that I, I have an inkling, a feeling that perhaps Denmark could get first. I don't know, man. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just don't know if I see Denmark being able to get a result that big on, the, on a stage of this level. It makes sense for them to be able to pull off that result in a Nations League game, but in a World Cup match, man, Ooh, when everyone's watching and yeah. it's... It's also t a test of that dog in you. Damn. I don't know if Denmark has it the way France does. So Shit. I think I'm going to go with France getting first here. Wouldn't be surprised if they get second, though. And they make it out of this group. And I'm going to just fast forward down the line. I think France makes semifinals. Okay. I think France makes semifinals, and they have a genuine possibility to go to the finals. They're the European team that I am most confident in that can make the final. And I see them just as a a really, really good candidate to win the tournament. Man, you got me fantasizing about that Denmark-France game. Oh my God, bro. That game's Banger. gonna be electric, Banger. dude. Be on the edge of my seat for 90 fucking minutes, bro. But if Denmark <laughs> do win that game, they're going, oh, to, they're going to the final. <laughs> yeah, they're going to the final. <laughs> That's that type of trajectory. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. No, but to talk about France and what I think they'll do at this World Cup, man, I, I, I guess I have two points. One point... I guess to kind of bring all of my thoughts together and all the squad that we've talked about, I am so impressed with the talent that this France squad has, man. Whether it's by design in the French youth system, whether it's just good squad selection from Deschamps, good competition in League One, I'm not exactly sure what it is. But my God, has it really worked out for this France squad. So much so that yes, I agree, there is no way that the curse upholds itself in 2022. There's just no way. France is going to get out of this group, whether it's first or second. I'm not 100% sure, but France will get out of this group. I think it does help that they play one of the weakest sides in Australia and, you know, and, and a weak Tunisian side, yeah. just, just to be very yeah. frank. If they were in a tougher group, I'd have to definitely rethink maybe a couple of things. But because they're in this specific group, I just, I do see them getting out of this group. The curse is over. You can rejoice, <laughs> you can rejoice, and praise be, the curse is over. France 2022 will defeat the curse. The only thing, the only thing that slightly worries me about how far this France squad truly can go is what made them successful in 2018, man, in my opinion, was that every player had a very specific role. I already talked about it. Midfield creation with Pogba, ball retrieval with Conte, roaming with Matuidi defensively and offensively, receiver selflessness in Olivier Giroud and then ruthlessness with Mbappe. And then, you again, you already said it, you had, you had Hernandez and Pavard just being dogs, picking their moments when to go forward, but also being very good defensively. Varane, world class. Yori, same thing. The way that I think that Champs has tried to fix this is I think he's just gone with pure talent rather than a role type of team. And I don't know if that's going to be the true solution to repeat a title win. I don't know. Because when you look at what he's just kind of throwing out there, yes, it's world-class players. But are they going to play the same roles that made them successful in 2018? I think the answer is obviously no. But are they even going to try to? Is Choi Meni going to try to find a role in this French squad? Or is he just going to use the skill set that he has and try and figure things out kind of as the tournament runs its course, you know? I, I, I do, truly do wonder, is Rabiot the right guy to start alongside Choi Meni? Yeah. You know? Because yeah. it was very clear that Kante and Pogba were the yeah. midfielders. That was so easy to decide. But 
who is that other midfielder? I, I don't know. And even if they do well, is it going to be enough to go yeah. for a title contention? Does a combination actually actually exist outside of Pablo and Conte that right. can actually lead them to a title? Exactly. Yeah. And the thing is, you could actually argue that the supporting cast outside of the main core might be a little bit better. You actually could argue that, and I would entertain it, absolutely. But I do think the lack of definitive roles might actually hurt this French squad as far as title contention is concerned. Because to go to the very end, to lift that trophy, you are the best team. And I really do, I really do believe that when you look at Spain, Germany, and yes, even France in 2018, every single one of those teams had roles, bro. They had very defined positions out there, and every single player rose to the occasion and filled that role that needed to be filled. I don't know if that I don't know if this friend squad can do that. I really don't. But then again, you know, this might be another case of like Madrid, the Champions League last year, where mm. Madrid were not the best team. But what happened? They just consistently had the better players out on the pitch. Consistently. Yeah. Over 90 minutes against all of their opponents. Class does win, I think, overall. Especially to especially now, bro. Especially in the modern game where if you can just score. Goals are at a premium nowadays, man. And when you have some of the most elite offensive players in your team, that might be enough. It might be enough to not even need roles anymore. And I guess we'll find out in, that, in this World Cup, bro. We'll find out. Because if France go far, then I, I think that will, that'll, that'll determine it for me in the case of that, look, at the end of the day, you just need really, really world-class players. And that, that's the thing. When you do have world-class players like that, you can, they can find the roles. They, they can figure it out. They have high enough IQ to outdo their opponents. I'm very, very excited to see what France do in 2022. I do have them going to the semifinals, though. I can tell you that. The squad is just too talented for me. Yeah. Too, Way too, too, too stacked. talented. Too stacked. And whether they lift it or not, I, 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 I haven't put full thought to it yet. You're a big Europe guy. I, I'm a big Europe guy. Is this not the team? <laughs> no, it actually definitely could be. I think you're right in the sense of like, when you think about European teams, France is probably right up there with Brazil and Argentina. 100% agree. And so for that reason, I have France going to the semifinals. I think anything less than that, honestly, would be pretty disappointing. Mm-hmm. When you look at the, the amount of firepower and the studs that they have out on that pitch, night for every 90 minutes they gotta go to the semi-final unless they play like an incredible team in the quarters or some shit like that yeah. that's the fate that i see for france in 2022 bro and that is france make sure to comment and let us know what do you guys think about this french team will the curse get them will they manage to defend <laughs> their championship once we get these deep dives done we'll be doing an official final world cup prediction video where we list out our results for every group and our champion and everything that involves the world cup so watch out for that in the meantime make sure to subscribe comment and like and stay updated because we got lots more content coming we'll see you guys soon peace